getting my cues from Ruthie here. She says my good evening doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Good evening. Well, that's not exactly what <laughs> That is the Seaford paraphrase. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's open in a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you tonight and just praising and glorifying your name. We thank you so much for being in our presence, Lord, for leading and guiding and directing us. We pray that as a result of our study that we would learn to be more submissive to your leading, that we would know uh, how you are directing us and with clarity be able to discern what our gifts are so that as you do lead us, we are faithful to that call. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Two really neat gifts, spiritual gifts tonight. The gift of mercy and the gift of prophecy. You're going to see some uh, clear distinctions between two gifts tonight that are very different in their application, but are very essential to come together within the body of Christ. And I don't think a lot of times people see, they, they see, well, that gift is very different than that gift. But what I really want you to see tonight is how blessed we are that when these gifts really do come together and one complements the other. Uh, Elva has the gift of mercy. Uh, I have more of a prophetic gift tonight, so you'll see two very different gifts, but the complementary value of those gifts in the body of Christ is really important that we understand because one does not offset the other, but complements the other. It brings together uh, the wholeness of how the body of Christ should work, and these two perhaps, in looking at them together, will play that out more than any other two uh, spiritual gifts maybe that we can look at side by side. So that's one of the reasons I like to do these two beside one another. First what we're going to do is mercy and then we'll come back and look at prophecy. The spiritual gift of mercy or compassion, some say, uh, is a gift that is, is wonderful within the body of Christ because it brings, it brings a sense of healing and calm and uh, a sense of, of love is expressed in a way that just simply somebody saying, well, I love you doesn't express. And so the, the mercy gift uh, from the outset does need to be understood to have an important role in the body of Christ. It also has pitfalls like all the other gifts that we looked at when it, when it is totally by itself without complementary value of other gifts in the body. Sometimes God will give, give us mutually uh, exclusive gifts to, to an individual that do complement one another, but quite often it is two people or three within the body of Christ that these gifts come together. Uh, if for no other reason the priority which Christ gave acts of mercy, I mean 5 7, who's, if somebody's got a Bible, turn to Matthew 5 7. Uh, while I read the rest of this. Paul in Galatians 6.2, which we'll be looking at in a few weeks on a Sunday morning, instructs or commands us uh, the, the full manifestations of mercy. Now, when I say the full manifestations of mercy, that is in an unpolluted uh, full manifestation. Now, what I mean by that is the pitfalls of each of these gifts provide some opportunity within the body of Christ for us to abuse the gifts that we have or for one to overpower another gift or for somebody to get so carried away with the gift of mercy, for example, that they become enablers for people. Though that kind of gift where you come alongside somebody and you go, well, poor, poor, pitiful you, uh, you're just the victim, and pretty soon the person begins to, to think, well, they're just... They're just the victim, and nobody can, I mean, they, they don't have anything to say about it. They're purely the victim. The person purely with the gift of mercy that is enacting that in a pure way is going to always uh, encourage and enable and help that person get beyond that place that they are in such need. And so that the gift of mercy doesn't just say, pat them on the head and say, well, poor little you. 
that actually comes alongside and encourages a person to move past whatever the issue is that's going on in their life. And so it's, it's a complete gift. Matthew 5, 7. Somebody got that? Yeah. Carol. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Okay. So right there in the Beatitudes, Christ is, is saying this uh, is a blessing. Uh, the word blessed there also means happy, joyful, happy. Uh, happy is the person who, okay, now... Galatians 6.2 instructs or commands the full manifestation of mercy. Who has Galatians 6.2? Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Okay. So carrying the person's burdens infers that we're not just patting somebody on the head. Okay. It is actually getting in and getting up under the burdens of that person and learning to carry that. Sometimes I think we come to church on a Sunday morning and we, we go, somebody shares a need in their life and we go, well, bless your little heart, as we say in the South. Bless your little heart. You know, that, that's, that, doesn't, that doesn't get up under the burden of that person and begin to help them reach the end of the, the, that burden, whatever it is. So coming up against that are these things. People with the gift can, and if not pursuing the fullness of the gift become uh, stuck in sympathy versus empathy. What's the difference between sympathy and empathy? Um, one of them, I always get these confused, is being able to mentally see how you think that that would feel. And the other one is more of actually feeling it also. So sympathy may be just uh, poor, poor, pitiful you. I'm sorry that, that you're hurt in that way. Empathy really begins to incorporate and understand what the ramifications of that are and, and see how that can be helped. And so the person with mercy would have more of an empathetic value in dealing with that person and helping them get past whatever the issues are that are in their life. And sympathy is, a, is really in the body of Christ, may be considered nice, but it may not be the healthiest thing. True empathy, it becomes a very healthy thing in the body of Christ, to really come alongside of a person and encourage them past whatever situation they're in. The danger of the gift is thus making codependence or simply enabling uh, a pity party. Okay? Well, that's too bad. And the person goes home and has a pity party. And that doesn't help anything, does it? To, to really help the person get past that. See, it's the difference in the body of Christ of, of being um, an acquaintance and being a friend. Being, being a friend comes alongside and really undergirds and encourages. And it's not just a sympathy pat on the head. It is, well, let's let's get this done. What can we do? What can we do to get through this? Maybe it's sitting down and praying with a person. Sometimes uh, that's the very best thing you can do for somebody is to sit down and pray with them. Because there's really sometimes nothing more that you can do about a particular situation. Something happens. Somebody's hurt. Somebody is, somebody's uh, had a, a child that's been hurt or died or whatever. Uh, I remember going to, to a funeral that was a closed funeral. Uh, Dr. Geisler's daughter, and uh, and she had committed suicide, and and there there was only a few people at this funeral, and I was invited to come to that, and I remember I never had met the girl, and I went and I was standing at the casket, and coming up behind me, and I didn't seem till he got there was Dr. Geisler, and he threw his arm around me, and I just looked at him and I thought, what do I say to this yeah. man? I mean, what do you say? And so he looked me right in the face and he said, you really don't know what to say, do you? And I said, no. He said, just hold me. Just hold me. And I thought, I mean, this is a, this is a guy that's normally considered sort of a disconnected, almost a cold individual. He said, just hold me. And the, sometimes the best thing mercy can do at any particular point in time is just hold somebody. Just be there. Pray with them. En encourage them by being there. Uh, I remember another time sitting in a hospital with a guy that after 
a second heart transplant, and his body was rejecting the second heart. This is a guy that's 42 years old, and I'm sitting with him, and uh, we, we'd sit for hours sometimes, and I would, I would probably been in the room two hours without either one of us talking, and I said, Kevin, you know, I, I really don't know what to say to you, and he said, you're here. Yeah. You're here. Makes a difference. That's, sometimes that's what mercy does. It's just, it's, you're there. And you you're hold somebody and you pray with somebody. And then sometimes there's very physical things you can do. And the person with mercy is going to see those things and understand them. And, and quite often behind the scenes, either choreograph a group of people stepping in and doing those things or just go about doing it themselves. And so that's what the gift of mercy really does. And if it's done well within the body, it brings real healing to the body versus just, I'm sorry that you're going through that. It brings healing to the individual, to the family, to the body. Quite often in those situations, the non-believer will look into that and say, boy, there is something different about the body of Christ. There really is something different about people who know the Lord. And that opens up the opportunity for evangelism to take place. That is a, a very strong, often uh, viewed byproduct of mercy taking its full course, is as they see the body of Christ really helping healing come about, uh, that's what happens. So to provide comfort and healing to the body, when people with the gift of mercy do see a, a, the bigger picture, uh, and that initial comfort needs to be directed into ultimate sustained spiritual growth. Now, what do I mean by that? That the, comforting the individual isn't the end of the journey. That comforting the individual in whatever they're going through is just the beginning of the journey. I think those of us that don't have the gift of mercy, we look at that and we go, well, the person with the gift of mercy just kind of helps them through that particular thing, and then their, their job kind of ends. The person with the gift of mercy continues to see how what they're doing will bring real joy and spiritual growth to that individual ultimately. And they hang in there and they're with them. I mean, I, I've, I've watched people that, that have, that are blessed with the gift of mercy, just go and give and give. But if they're, if they're not just placating people and they're really helping healing, they're there for the long term. And they're, they're not in somebody's way, they're not, they're not uh, conspicuous oftentimes to the families of these people, but they're there to see them through. And that brings spiritual growth. Why is that? Because within our culture and in our society, there aren't many people. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't count on one hand the people that would come alongside of me before I became a Christian that would, that would just hang in there with me no matter what. In fact, quite often, as long as I was popular, people loved me. When, I, when things begin to be questionable, then they started going, well, I don't know if I want to be associated with that kind of talk or not. And then they, they'll kind of back off. But the person that genuinely has this gift, no matter what the crisis is in somebody's life, they're there to hang in and help see them through. They're, these people are also very sensitive to an individual's um, real need. Now, what I mean by that is this. The real need for me, quite often, is let's say that I'm very sick. The real need for me when I'm really sick is just to leave me alone. Other people, when they're really sick, they need to be comforted and held, and you know, they, need to, they need a warm pot of soup and all of that kind of thing. Uh, the person with a gift of mercy discerns that and goes and gravitates the way of really bringing healing to that person's life. So that is, that's the, the, uh, the instincts of a person that has this particular gift. Um, there is a cycle that a person goes through that they, they need more comfort or mercy than at other times in their life. And the person that has this gift senses that and knows when to step in and when to step back. Uh, like the other gifts of the Spirit, the gift of mercy is always to be applied cheerfully, positively, and with genuine joy. 
Somebody read Romans 12. Love Romans 12, verse number 8. Romans 12, verse 8. I got it? I got it. Okay, David. The one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. With cheerfulness. Sometimes I've seen people in the church that are trying to be merciful and comforting to people and what happens is they, because they're not cheerful, they end up bringing those people down. They, they say they're, that they're trying to help cheer them up, but because of their attitude toward whatever the situation is. I mean, let, let's say you've got the gift of mercy and somebody has uh, a particularly ill person in the family. And they go to that person and they, they continue to talk about how terrible the illness is and how really hopeless the illness is. And they dwell on that rather than on Christ being the ultimate comforter. Uh, th- then the, the point of the picture is, is headed in the wrong direction. The point of the, of the conversation is, 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 is not comforting to the individual. It, is, it may be affirming how they're feeling, but it's not comforting. Does that make it sense? So what we're saying there is there's a difference between just being there and talking about the issue and really bringing comfort into the issue. And so people can come to somebody who is suffering under whatever the situation is, and probably you've, you've been in some of those situations. Somebody comes in to, the, to a hospital room, and I've been there in hospital rooms where people come in, and I go, I wish you'd just leave. I mean, you're not helping this family at all. Just go away. And they're, tr- they're genuinely trying to be comforting. But the person with the gift of mercy, they understand that comfort is bringing about a, a healing into the situation, even if they can't fix the, the physical healing that needs to take place. They can bring a comfort and a spiritual healing to that situation. Okay. So that's, that's, therein lies the difference. The performance of the act of mercy in resentment seriously dilutes or worse pollutes the effectiveness and the rewards of the giver and the receiver of the act. When mercy is applied in joy, it tends to breed that joy and comfort into the receiver and propel them into a genuine desire for spiritual growth and joy. That's, that should be the end result of this. When a giver of mercy gives in resentment and pain, the receiver tends to think that these are the attitudes, uh, that these attitudes are the answer and seeks consciously or subconsciously to seek a deep, deeper resentment. So in other words, if, if a person comes in trying to comfort but brings in a resentment, well, that person just shouldn't, should never have done that to you. I understand why you're so mad at them. I, I would, I'd be mad at them too. I, I just wouldn't get over it if I were you. That's not helping anything. Okay? That's not helping a thing. Uh, modern Freudian psychology has perpetuated this sort of man-centered thought in a lot of ways. Um, it's all about me. It's all, it's all about the physical realm. Uh, the approach seeks to solve spiritual problems with failed human resolutions. I think a lot of times psychology doesn't recognize, they, they may say, they may talk about spiritual, spirituality, but it's not in the terms of the spiritual nature of knowing Christ. Uh, spirituality can mean a lot of things. And spirituality can lead to people reaching very, very wrong conclusions. So the, the, the focus on Christ in a spiritual relationship is, is the most important thing there. People with the gift of mercy must move past the surface resolution. Sometimes the people with the gift of mercy uh, want to put a Band-Aid on something because they really do want to see it fixed. But the Band-Aid doesn't resolve the issue. It only covers up the wound. And so the person with the gift of mercy will go deeper than that and want to resolve the real issue in the person's life and help them through that. Uh, they're there to, to apply the balm of Gilead. They're there to, to, 
to put on the bandages, to take off the bandages, to clean the wounds, to be there to, to support that person. They're, they're there for the whole process. When a mature person with a gift of mercy does this, they bring healing to individuals and to the whole body of Christ. It's, we've talked about the body of Christ uh, a lot, and one of the things we need to understand is it is very much as the scriptures say, uh, that it is like a body. I mean, we have people here that are hands and eyeballs and hair follicles. and We even have a few kidneys in the room, I think. And, and all of us are essential. And when one part of us hurts, uh, the rest of us suffers dramatically. You know? So that body picture is very much correct for the body of Christ. And so why is that person with the gift of mercy so essential in the body of Christ because there's always someone hurting in the body. I can promise you, it doesn't matter if you've got a, a church of seven people, there's always somebody in the body of Christ that is hurting in some way. And most of the time, all of us are hurting in some way. We, we need that person that can come in and really see and make a difference. We, we need to appreciate those people with that gift. Often they're not the people on the front line going, well, let me help you, out loud. They're not, they're not sort of pharisaical mercy givers. Often they're people behind the scenes that just quietly go about the business of making sure <coughs> people are healing. They're, sometimes they're not terribly outgoing. They just they get the job done. They're not looking for a pat on the head. They're not looking for anything in the way of a human reward, they're looking to, to genuinely be of service to Christ. And that makes a huge difference. So less Band-Aids and more Bob and Gilead, that's what I'm saying. Okay. When resolution is settled for, uh, and solutions never truly apply, time <coughs> bombs are created. In other words, if you just put a Band-Aid on something, you, often you're just creating a fuse of something that's going to blow up later on. There really needs to be healing brought into whatever the situation is. And the person with the gift of mercy often sees that, the, that the roots of issues are deeper than they might first appear. Uh, you've got to deal with the whole problem. Uh, yeah, the... the the more intense the situation is, the more that we really need these people. Mercy, uh, mercy people step back, they look at the big picture, and, and they will do much to provide the calm. They're not just looking at how one thing might be affecting a person, but they're seeing a bigger picture. When I was sitting with Kevin in the hospital after his second heart transplant, we all knew he was dying. We all knew that the doctors weren't going to give him a second heart, a third heart. Uh, he, he knew that it would, that his his days were very limited. It was actually down to hours. And the per, the people that I that I saw come in the room had all kinds of things to say to him. But one particular gentleman, with the gift of mercy, that came in uh, saw beyond the heart beyond the, the, the fact that he was about to die and saw bigger issues that, I mean, Kevin was thinking about his, his family, his daughter who was in college, his adopted son from, um, from Dominican Republic who was just a little tyke and had a lot of physical problems of his own. He saw the, the financial issues that were facing the family. And he came in and talked to Kevin about all of those things. All the rest of us were looking at him and going, the man's dying. What do we do to comfort him? Well, what he really needed was to have somebody come in and talk to him about his son and his daughter and his wife and his family and his financial situation and everything regarding the, all the pieces of his life that had to be sitting there running through his mind. He needed that, and the person with the gift of mercy came in, and he looked at Kevin, and he sat down and just started talking, and I watched as he unpacked all these things that, that no doubt was going through Kevin's mind. And all the rest of us were just trying to go, you know, it's, it's okay. If everything's going to be okay. And he addressed the real issues. And he did it in such a way that was not offensive, that was very much there to comfort, uh, comfort the man. Mercy acts are required in the body and should always be uh, a temporal result of showing someone the truth. 
Uh, the, in other words, the act of mercy never tries to heal with a lie. With a lie? With a lie. It, it just, it, you know, to sit there, it's like the doctor saying, well, coming in there and telling Kevin, well, you're not really dying. It's going to be okay. You know, that, that's not helping anything. So to come in and deal with truthful, truthfully deal with issues that are important. Where the prophet speaks truth, mercy always seeks ultimate comfort and for the receiver of mercy and the acts that, that seek solution through the truth. The truth will always help deal with whatever the situations are. Uh, truth telling is a, uh, an attribute of the person that with the gift of prophecy we're going to look at next. But often that person, if they don't have some body or they don't have some sense of mercy themselves, can be very frank, very direct, and sometimes to the point that people will reject that truth. And so the person with mercy knows how to bring that and make it in such a way that that truth is going to be received uh, be palatable, digestible by the person that's suffering in some way. True mercy never seeks to, to sweep pain under the rug or simply allow to receive or to of mercy to not experience what remains a problem. Uh, it wasn't going to help anybody to, to come in to my buddy Jack in, in Arkansas and tell him the next day he wasn't going to have any pain. He, he, he had pain every day of his life, excruciating, horrible pain to the point that when he lay down, that just the pressure of the mattress against his skin, he, that he couldn't lay down. Uh, I mean, that's the kind of pain that was con There's, Wasn't anybody going to help him by coming in and trying to tell him or explain to him that he didn't have pain? He had pain. And, he, and, and God was using him right in the middle of that pain. But, you know, when you're suffering pain, it's hard. It's hard to see how God's using that. But what God had done with, with him is he'd put him in a situation to where really all he could do was stay home. And what he did with his life is pray. Elva and I are on his prayer list every day. Brother Jack prays for us. And sometimes multiple times a day. He, he, takes, he takes what God has given him as a, as a fact of life that he is in that pain and no doctor can address it. And he, he says, okay, I can't work. I can't physically hold down a job, but I can pray. And he spends a lot of time in prayer. But it would not help for somebody to come alongside of him and say, well, you're just useless now. Somebody came alongside of him and said, well, look what you can do. You're a, you're a prayer warrior. You know, and so that's how he spends his days. All day, every day, and spending them in prayer. The worldly manifestations of peace are not always reflective of true condition. In other words, somebody says, well, we'll want peace at any, any price. We want peace in the church at any price, so ignore the facts. Ignore the truth. Ignore the person that says they're hurting. No, that's not the way to get there. True peace is deeper than that. Putting Band-Aids on something to try to make it look like it's a peaceful situation doesn't ever resolve anything. Uh, so that's, that's something we've, that's hard for the mercy to do. But they quickly come to understand once they've done that, that that is essential to get to the bottom of whatever the situations are. Genu genuine mercy builds character and integrity. It doesn't take character and integrity away from somebody. It helps them build on that. And quite often, the person that just comes in with sympathy into somebody's life ends up taking the character and integrity away from that person. A person with a gift of mercy sees past that, and they, they understand, uh, because of their gift, they understand how to apply true empathy while at the same time encouraging the character and the, and the integrity of the individual. And I think that, that therein lies a huge difference in the body. When a person can come out of whatever the situation is in their life that's bringing them down with a sense of integrity, you, you have brought real value into that person's life. And that's what the person with the gift of mercy does. They bring that kind of value. So, mercy. Mercy, mercy me. Remember that song? Questions, answers, talks.
it's also important, I think, uh, not only Mercy, but some of the other gifts, that we don't get involved in such a way that it, it is detrimental to us. Mm. Yeah. You know, I have a good friend who was a Bible college graduate, <coughs> and he just had a way of listening to people. And his professors noticed that he, he, he was a good listener. So they said, Danny, you need to be a counselor. Mm -hmm. And so um, Danny, after he got married, and actually he was counseling, you know, in a Christian counseling outfit. And finally his wife, Marcia, says, Danny, you gotta quit this. Mm -hmm. Because he was bringing it home. Yeah. And it just, I mean, someone would come in and share, and he'd, he'd tell Marcia, I cannot share with you. What's going on? But he would, it, it just drug him down. Finally, she said, Danny, you've got to quit that. You can be a good listener. And this is our friend Danny, <coughs> his last name is actually Smith, Danny Vernon, the Elvis Presley tribute artist. And now his wife, Marcia, has to lead interception for him because after a performance or before a performance with his music, people will come up and, and they'll want to talk about uh, the history of Elvis and everything, and Danny would just stand there, and he's just an excellent listener. He didn't care who talk, he just, he just is an excellent listener, and, and he, he, it doesn't just go in one ear and out the other, but it had, and finally Marcia has to look at him, and sometimes she just comes, she has a way of being able to interrupt, you know, uh, I'm his manager, and I need to, he needs to be back. <laughs> no, you're not his manager, you're his wife, but, 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 uh, and, but he's learned, you know, down through the years that, that uh, he certainly cannot be a counselor. Like all of the gifts, uh, and I, I've said this before, but I want, I want to really be terribly clear about this. Because you're given the gift doesn't mean you have the ability or the instinct or the knowledge to know exactly how to apply that gift in every situation. We need to be growing in our gifts. And so one of the things he needs to do is to learn where that line is and how to gracefully bow out of that. Uh, I still deal with that. Elva will tell you, I, I, I deal with those kind of issues all the time. But to be able to just to do that and to have somebody that can come alongside you and encourage you in that. But all of our gifts need to be developed and learned. Uh, so we've got the gift, and now we need to develop that gift. It's like going... To, to college and, and learning some particular subject, but I can tell you I, I've been through masters and my doctorate in, in seminary, and let me tell you, that doesn't teach you how to do ministry. It gives you a, a bunch of knowledge about stuff, but it, it, you are terribly ill-equipped to do ministry. Uh, that, that takes real-life application. You need somebody like Pastor Tom to come alongside of you and go, now, here's how you bring application to that. And you need to grow in that and learn those things. So what, that's one of the things in mercy that you, have to, that you have to learn. And we need to keep in mind, and sometimes we lose track of this, that these are gifts yeah. of the Spirit. 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 Therefore, they must be nurtured and developed yeah. and learned in the Spirit. by the Spirit. Yeah. 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 Just Amen. trusting, you know, okay, I need to... I yeah. have this gift that the Holy Spirit has given me, but it's also, it needs to be nurtured by the Spirit. You know, I keep, I keep saying that they're supernaturally given, they're supernaturally empowered, Amen. and they're supernaturally employed. And when we try to do it outside of that is when we normally get into that trouble that you're talking about because we can get, you know, it doesn't mean you won't get tired uh, working in, the, in that particular area of your gift. But it does mean that, that you have, it's what I call a good tired. It's, it's the difference between uh, being able to apply that and, and be rewarded by that, encouraged by that, and doing something that just brings you down. You know? And if you're doing it in the, in the physical realm exclusively, I can promise you, your, your weariness will go beyond the physical. If you're doing it in the spirit, you're going to find yourself encouraged even when you're physically tired. Let me yeah. ask you a question, and I ask this to you because you're 
more equipped to answer this as far as the, from the Greek and the Hebrew than I certainly am, but you know, the Old Testament talked in the tabernacle about the mercy seat. And I wonder if there's any correlation here, which that simply means, you know, and, and of course it's uh, in the New Testament you find the word propitiation, which is, you know, that tied to that, and means kind of that satisfaction. I wonder how, how this gift plays into that, if it does at all. Yeah, I, I think there's probably some, some word overlap there. The difference between expiation and propitiation uh, could explain some of that. In the Old Testament, the, when the animal was sacrificed, it was an expiation of our sin. It was, you put the sin on the animal and he died for your sin. The propitiation, Christ became our sin for us. He died for us. So there is more of an involvement there, uh, commitment there. Uh, it's done, in, as, you, as you said, in the spirit. We're, we're not, none of us are capable of doing any of these things physically. And part of our problem is, as we, as we find our gifts, then we go out and we go, okay, I got this gift. Now I've got to do this right now or this way. Well, instead of looking for what is the Spirit showing you, how are you, how are you called on to employ your gifts within the body of Christ? And all of that becomes, is really a learned process because we've got to become sensitive to the Spirit. We've got to be led by the Spirit in those things. Yeah, David. Um, I, I kind of get caught up in that. Um, if I have something I consider to be a gift, whatever it may be, I always come back to that verse that to whom much is given, much is expected. And so I tend to get caught up in, well, I've been given this gift. I really need to make the most of this gift. And I think sometimes I tend to get a little carried away. Well, let's, let's go back and address the quote first. <coughs> Uh, to whom much is given, much is required, is the better translation. It is, it is a required. But we've got to understand that while that may put you under more pressure if you're trying to do that in, in the physical realm alone, it, it empowers the person that is, that is looking to the spirit for guidance and to, to actually carry out the work of the gift. Uh, you... I'm, I'm going to say when we get through, when I'm going to send you out the, the surveys this next week, uh, when you get through with your survey, you're going you're gonna to find, I, I would be willing to, to venture a guess that you have the gift of helps in there somewhere. And that within that, you can get, you can get very caught up doing physical things outside of the body of Christ, uh, or outside of the spirit of Christ, and find yourself... Uh, not only physically exhausted, but not, um, not fulfilled in doing that. The person that is genuinely allowing the Spirit to work through them in that gift is going to al allow that to happen in such a way that the Spirit is guiding them and they're going to be fulfilled because they look at that and they go, okay, this is what the Spirit has worked in me. This is the gift that the Spirit has given me. I have yielded myself to the Spirit with regard to these things, and there is a fulfillment in that. Whereas if I'm just going out, I've got to get this done. I'm, it's, okay, it's one more thing on my checklist. I'm just checking it off, going down the list. Now, I, don't get me wrong, I've got a list every day. But it, it, it's, that is not the, my fulfillment doesn't come in doing this. And my fulfillment comes in seeing God's work applied in the body of Christ to, a, to the way that, that people are blessed and people are growing spiritually. Just to give you guys some background, this projector up here belongs to the camp. It doesn't belong to us. We're in the process of replacing that. And David Fulmar and David O are both working on getting us a projector up here in a timely way because this one disappears in a couple of weeks for, for about four weeks. Okay. These guys are, okay, well, every detail, how does it mount? How close does it need to be to a screen? We, how, how many lumens does it have? <laughs> all, all this stuff has to be weighed out in terms of what's going to work up here. What's a lumen? <laughs> <laughs> 
So, you know, I brought a projector. <laughs> I brought a projector with me. It won't hook to that mount, and it won't plug into those plugs. There's a whole series of things to contend with there that these guys are doing. Now, they can do that, and just and, and the end result of that is both of them just end up tired, and we end up with a projector up there. Or they can do that in such a way that when they sit down here on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, they look up there and go, that's bringing glory to God. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the result, you know. Yeah. And, and praise the Lord, that ought to be the result of them employing their spiritual gift of helps. You know, that's what's happening behind the scenes. The, these same two guys out here cutting down brush, uh, bushes in front of the church this past week call me out there and say, what do you think about cutting these bushes down? I look at it and go, looks good to me. You know, <laughs> cut them down. Uh, and then before I know it, there's a ladder out there and they're scraping the windows and pulling the old tape off and all that stuff. I mean, the end result of that can either be, you know, I'm through with the work today and go home and I'm t just tired. Or it can be that makes things nicer for people to come in. They can come in with a more relaxed atmosphere. They can come in and genuinely grow more because of, of being able to walk in with a cleaned up front of the church. Just It's little things, though, that bring real joy to, to the thing. Okay, quickly, <coughs> what time we got? I'm not going to get through this. Uh, I'll tell you what, we're going to come back to this one next week. Um, prophecy. Let me just give you give you the, a quickie of this because I don't want you to misunderstand as we go out of here tonight. Uh, Old Testament prophets and prophecy, watch my words carefully here, was often foretelling God's word. God would speak to the prophet. He would tell what was going to happen. And often those weren't very popular messages. You know the history of the prophets. Uh, they, and New Testament prophets, and, and by the way, many Old Testament prophets, because we don't think about this, were not foretelling God's word. They were forthtelling God's word. The New Testament prophet is not going to be prophesying future events outside of the word of God. They will be forthtelling the word of God. They will be able to take the word of God and speak it forth in such a way that it, that it makes it understandable for people to comprehend, and they will be able then to apply that word to their life. So when I talk about prophecy, I'm not talking about somebody that just goes, well, I prophesy over you that this is going to happen to you, and da 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 That's not what I'm talking about. There, there's a lot of that going on in churches around America today and around the world, by the way. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody given the spiritual gift of being able to take God's word and, and explain it in such a way that makes sense. And oftentimes, oftentimes, that will allow that person to see the natural outcome of world events, local events. Because we know what human nature is. We're all fallen human beings. We know what the, what the actions of fallen human beings are and how they react to certain things. So they often, because they, they see and understand how to expound on God's word properly, that they will be able to discern the direction things are going. Uh, I know there's been times that, that, uh, that I have said something to somebody and I'm often, I have to be very careful about how I say those things. But I'm not, I'm not Gene Dixon. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm saying this is what God's word says. This is the nature of, of, of fallen humanity. Here's the, con the condition of what's taking place right around us. This might be the natural outcome of all of this. But God's word says, but... Okay, so that's what we're going to get into next week. All right. So I want to take the rest of the time and spend some time in prayer tonight. <coughs> so let's, uh, I do want to be praying for our country. 
Uh, I am and continue to be very concerned about what's going on with regard to uh, the Supreme Court decisions and how we react as the Christian community to all of these things. And we need to, we need to be very careful about how we respond to those things. And in the church, one of the other things that's going on within churches, I know all over this area because I've been in touch with some of the pastors, is we're thinking about uh, how do we deal with particular issues in the church as a, as a result of some of the things that have come down. And you know, some of those issues will be tested and challenged and we just need to, we need to understand, uh, number one, that, that God loves every person. We need, we need to be compassionate when dealing with people and make every person feel welcome to walk into this church and to hear the message of God. We need to stand firm on what God's word says about particular issues. And then we need to deal with them uh, lovingly, compassionately, uh, but forthrightly. And so all of those things come into how do, we, how do we structure a response to people? And Because everybody's got a soul, and every soul needs to be saved and know Jesus. And that's, that's what we need to be about. Yes, sir.